what's the purpose of a model? Well, a model takes something complicated and hard to understand and makes it simple, easy to understand, so that we can learn something, right? Well, today we're going to be looking at a new model, the production possibilities frontier or production possibilities curve. And this model is going to help us learn a little something about the economy. Basically, the idea is we assume an economy with only two goods, so only two things being produced. And we see all the possible combinations of production. So let's go ahead and dive in. To help us out today, got a little sheet of paper. Our economy today is just going to be this class, okay? Just this class. So, we can fold this sheet of paper two ways, right? Hot dog or hamburger. Hot dog and hamburger. So our economy's two goods are going to be hot dogs and hamburgers. So go ahead, take a second, get a sheet of paper out, and uh, fold it either hot dog or hamburger. And then we'll, we'll tally them up on the board. Okay. Hot dog. Sorry, it looked tasty. My bad. No, you need to put your mask on right. And I choose hamburger. Huh? Fold a sheet of paper? I already did it. Hot dog. I remember when the hamburger first came from Germany. <laughs> hamburger. <sighs> I just can't des decide. Uh. Well, I guess I'll do a hot dog. Uh, mine's hamburger. Oh, it's hot dog. Hot dog. Hot dog. Hot dog or hamburger? This is nowhere in my notes. Uh, I guess hamburger. Okay, so going around to each of you guys, it looks like we got a total of ten, uh, seven hot dogs, and three hamburgers. So we'll go ahead and write that down. Now, you all recognize a graph, right? Nothing too crazy, just your basic uh, Cartesian plane, right? Just simple graph, all right? So, now that we've got our numbers, let's go ahead and get this graphed. We got an economy with two goods. Perfect coincidence, it's not a coincidence. Perfect coincidence, we have two axes on our graph. So we're going to put our two goods on these two axes. So right here, hot dogs. And over here, our lovely little hamburgers. Hamburgers. So our total economy has 10 people in it, right? And 10 sheets of paper. So if we use all our resources to make our hot dogs, how many hot dogs could we make? 10. 10. We can make 10 hot dogs. So we can make 10 hot dogs. And if we use all of our resources to make hamburgers, hey, guess what? We can make 10 hamburgers. Again, we're just talking about the folded sheets of paper. All right, yeah, you're with me, you're with me. This is our basic production possibilities frontier. Okay, so let's put our, uh, our class on here. So up seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and over three, something like right here. So here's our class. 
and everyone has used a sheet of paper to make a hot dog or a hamburger. Okay. So this model has So this model has some assumptions, right? We got four basic assumptions for this model. We assume two goods. Could we make this model with three goods? Well, not in two dimensions, right? We'd need a third dimension coming out here. And what if we made it for every single good that an economy as large as the United States produces? Well, we'd need more dimensions than we can uh, really mentally picture. So to keep it simple so we can learn something, two goods. Okay? Okay. We are going to have fixed resources. In this case, limited number of papers, right? And we're going to have fixed technology. Uh, so just your hands to fold with, right? We don't have some uh, fancy technological machine to help us fold. Last but not least, full employment. Everyone in the class is going to be folding a sheet of paper, right? So these are our four assumptions of this model. Two goods, fixed resources, fixed technology, full employment. Okay. So look, our class has made seven and three. Seven hot dogs, three hamburgers. We have used every sheet of paper and every person's ability to create, right? Well, in economics, we have a word for this. And that word is efficient. We call an economy that's using all of its resources efficient. So what about an economy that isn't using all of its resources? Well, no surprise, we'll call that inefficient. As for where we can find that on this graph right here, anywhere underneath this curve is going to be inefficient. So say right here, the point five hot dogs, five hamburgers. That's going to be inefficient, right? We could move outwards and have more stuff given our current technology, resources, two goods, and full employment, right? We could have more stuff. So we don't want this inefficient outcome. What about this point right here? We're using all our resources so it's efficient, right? But the same is true here and here. Because it's along this curve, it represents us using all of our resources, right? Okay, so these are efficient points. What about out here? Can we make a point here? Can we have, oh, say, eight of each? Well, no, right? We've only got ten sheets of paper. We've only got ten classmates to work with. So we're not going to be able to make this point. We can't have this combination. It is unattainable. Unattainable. So, all points on or inside this line are attainable. All points outside this line are unattainable. This is our basic model of a production possibilities frontier. So let's look at this sheet of paper again. How hard would it be for me to turn a hamburger into a hot dog? Well, I just did it, right? You unfold it and you refold it. Yeah, maybe there's a crease, but you get the idea, right? Very simple. Very simple. Incredibly easy for us to switch back and forth, right? Is this usually the case if we were dealing with uh, a little more complex goods? So what if we were talking about the production of cars and corn? This wouldn't be so easy, right? 
It wouldn't be so easy. Our resources are not so simple as this, right? There are some resources that naturally are going to tend to help us uh, in the production of corn, and some resources that resources that are going to naturally help us in the production of cars. You know, think about a big urban center like Detroit. Well, this is a great place to make cars. There's lots of people, there's lots of businesses that are already making uh, resources that you're going to need, steel, rubber, stuff like that. So you already have a good industry uh, or good industries to help you create cars in this place, right? What about a field in Iowa? Is this a great place to make cars? No, right? You'd have to completely start from scratch. You'd have to build a factory and the town around it just to, uh, just to make this your, your production spot for cars. But for corn, oh Lord, the, gr the ground is fertile. It's the perfect place, the perfect place to grow, grow some corn. This is going to present a problem for us, or at least a little bit of a problem. Our simple model here has a straight line straight line from hot dogs to hamburgers. And that's reflecting the fact that we can switch on a one-to-one -one ratio, right? We can trade one hot dog for one hamburger all along this line and vice versa. What do we call that? Well, we can call it essentially the opportunity cost, the opportunity cost. For our production possibilities frontier, opportunity cost is the slope of the line. Opportunity cost is the slope of the line. Now, I don't want to get too far out into the math, but we take a point like 10, 0, and we take a point like 7, 3. We use our slope formula. You guys remember y minus y over x minus x, or so just change in y over change in x for our slope. So uh, y, whoop, 10, not 16, y minus y, and x minus x. Simplifies to negative 1, right? But that's just, of course, because this line is sloping downwards. We can almost think of it as a 1. But we're exchanging at a 1 to 1 rate because our opportunity cost is just 1. Does that make basic sense? Again, opportunity cost is what you give up to get something. It's the value of your next best alternative. Okay. Let's take a pause real quick and I'll come back. We'll have a different graph. So notice on this version of our PPF, our PPF isn't just a straight line, rather it's curved. It bows outward, and that's because of this uh, difficulty switching resources that I talked about. Once we've already invested resources in one, it's difficult to go back the other way. It's not this one-to-one -one trade off that we have with our folded sheets of hot dogs and hamburgers, right? And like I said, the slope of the line, the slope of the curve, is going to be our opportunity cost. So right here, our slope is almost flat. That's a very low slope, right? A very low slope. Small opportunity costs. As we move along, the slope of our line keeps getting more and more steep, representing higher and higher and higher opportunity costs. In economics, we call this the law of increasing opportunity costs. And uh, I'll post a little video that'll help flesh this out a little more in the description down below this. But we can see the basic idea of it here. So let's say that our economy, we'll assume this is the US just for fun, is producing right here. And we'll just throw some numbers. Let's say this is 8,000 cars right here, and this is 5,000 computers right here. 
and we get a nice compromise of say 6,000 cars and 4,000 computers just uh, for the sake of this model okay well we know that all points in here are going to be attainable right and all points on this line are also attainable the points out here for now are unattainable and the points in here are going to be inefficient. Anywhere under this curve are going to be inefficient because we're not taking advantage of all of our resources. Well, let's expand our thinking a little bit. What could possibly shift this curve outward? Well, what if we lighten our assumptions a little bit? We loosen our assumptions. What if we had a technological change? What if we had a new machine invented that made the production of cars significantly easier. Well, now we can reach this new point, creating 10,000 cars. But it hasn't affected the maximum amount of computers that we could make if we invest all of our resources into computers. Need an extra zero here. Something very interesting happens here, though we are able to move outwards not just in cars but also in computers so now we can make say another 200 computers and say another thousand cars because of this new innovation in the car market well i know what you're thinking why is that well by coming up with this new ability to produce cars, we've also freed up some of our extra resources for making computers. This technological shift has changed the game, right? Can you think of a possible reason why this curve might shrink? Go ahead and think about it for a second. Why might this curve shrink? Why might we be able to produce less? Well, I think a tragic example would be war, right? War. So if you can think back to the Second World War, um, you know, many countries in Europe and Asia were leveled by this horrendous conflict, right? Well, they would have had much less ability to produce, right? Their possible combinations would have been severely limited and so that would have shrunk their curve but a change in technology or even a change in resources although those are pretty rare uh, could represent our expansion to this curve so that about sums it up the production possibilities frontier